Hello everybody and welcome to the final test session for the one million dollar challenge here at Thermal Club. Open test session four and over the past couple of hours, uh, well an hour and 40 minutes, it has become very windy and very dusty. So we are under a weather delay here at the Thermal Club and let's join the Indie Radio team and wait for the timing screens to refresh for this text session. It's supposed to be windy to your point, Mark. This was forecasted. It was not a surprise that suddenly the conditions became windy, but nonetheless, it has led to a delay in getting this session underway. One session already in the books that was earlier today, actually two sessions yesterday and one today. The result of test session number three, Callum Eilat paced the way with a time of 138.7784. Alex Pillow was second quick. Christian Lungard, Scott McLaughlin, Pottawa Ward, the top five. Then Marcus Armstrong, Roman Grosjean, Colton Herta, Felix Rosenquist, Tom Blomquist. Uh, 11th was Will Power, 12th Scott Dixon, 13th Pietro Fittipaldi. Uh, 14th, Alexander Rossi, 15th, Marcus Erickson, rookie Letus Lundquist, the, uh, he's 16th quick, uh, Renus VK, 17th, Kyle Kirkwood, 18th, Augustin Canapino is 19th, uh, Graham Rahal, 20th, 21st, Santino Ferrucci, 22nd, St. Pete winner Joseph Newgarden, and then uh, four rookies, Christian Rasmussen, 23rd, 24th, Kiffin Simpson, 25th, Colin Brown, Nolan Siegel, his debut for Dale Coyne Racing, 26th, and 27th, Sting Ray Rob. A couple of incidents this morning, some issues with the track. Upon exit of the rumble strips in turn number five, some pieces of pavement started to come up, and so there was a red flag lasting oh, about 30 minutes or so. Uh, they used some uh, quick-drying epoxy and some compound to fill that in, did some additional work on it during this intermission, if you will, and they feel like that that is uh, back to normal. Roman Grosjean had an off that required him to be retrieved, and then uh, restarted. No damage to that race car, but Jake, a much more significant incident uh, in terms of uh, a minor damage to a race car to bring an early end of the session for Kyle Kirkwood. Yeah, Kyle Kirkwood was in turn number eight of this facility, which is kind of a long sweeping right hander, and it goes into another sweep that is turn number nine. And in the process of making that move, his car simply got irritated by what appeared to be kind of a bump in the middle of the track. He had mentioned to Michael Young that he had gone over that several times, but that he had not felt it until then, as we're about a minute away here from going to the green flag at Thermal. But when he all of a sudden got air and that bump in the road essentially got all four wheels off of the race surface for Kyle Kirkwood, he then, as the drivers often say, was just a passenger. And that car then made its way through the sand trap, if you will, and hit the guardrail area on the rear end that did obviously cause damage to the rear wing of the car good news is when he came back down and he didn't get a lot of air let's say one foot or so off the ground but there was no damage to Kyle Kirkwood that's the important thing he got out walked away under his own power went back and assessed the car and they knew then because it was towards the end of the session that was probably going to complete his practice session but like the others he will have the opportunity here inside of a minute if he so chooses to get right back out on to this 17-turn, just over three-mile facility. And again, a couple of days ago on Thursday, in fact, there was a blind draw uh, for the qualifying groups. We'll talk more about that, talk about the qualifying procedures a little bit later on today after we get the specifics on the conditions at Thermal Club from our Michael Young. Yeah, still 78 degrees, track temperature 101, but as we go green, there has been a small, well, I guess, front that is rolling through from the west. We saw some rain, and it's actually got to make it over a small mountain range to get to us, but potentially by 2 o'clock we may see some sprinkles, but with it came a ton of wind. As a matter of fact, out of nowhere, gusts of up to 20 to 30 miles an hour started to sweep across the thermal club, kicking up some dust, but it has died back down, so our fingers crossed that this front holds off, but as it stands right now, the uh, drivers are free to go out and take part in this second test of the afternoon and a lot of the drivers still back at the paddock area so we'll see who takes advantage of what as Pato Award and his uh, 
teammate uh, or former teammate Felix Rosenquist horsing around on pit lane. So should be a fun session. But like I said, everybody kind of waiting to see what happens. Yeah, it'd be uh, interesting to get the thoughts and impressions of a couple of those drivers, Michael, as they take a wait and see approach. Uh, about one minute or less than that from the green flag flying. And uh, we can see among the handful of drivers that are in their car while it sits on pit road uh, is Kyle Kirkwood, the aforementioned driver. And uh, I'm sure that uh, he's going to give it a shakedown and make sure that all of the repairs that they have made to that car, what were necessary, uh, have been covered and been taken care of. But again, Jake, we're talking about nine sets of tires over the course of the weekend. And uh, I would say in this session, they're going to be rather judicious with the number of laps that they thur turn throughout the course of this session. Uh, because let's face it, uh, given, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, you've got eight minutes per group, the two groups were set by random draw on Thursday. The result sets the lineup for the heat races. Uh, Boy, you got 10 laps or 20 minutes, and then, uh, you know, the top six advance from uh, from uh, from each round, and then you got a, a, a 20 laps into two 10-lap segments, and caution laps don't count. They'll get a, a chance to pit at the halfway mark, so uh, got to be careful to manage those tires to make sure that uh, uh, you, you have them available, I think, for qualifying, Jake, because really, in terms of your starting position, especially here, uh, they're going to work awfully hard to try to get those first five or six spots. And, you know, one of the things that comes into play, Mark, is the fact that, to reiterate it, this is not a weekend event that takes part in the season championship. In other words, there are no points here. It is all about cash. It's all about trying to win part of that $1.75 million purse that's there, $500,000 outright to the winner tomorrow. So there's no reason to try to go out and get yourself in a situation if it's late in the race of trying to conserve some room or make sure that you're coming in in a safe top 10 for points later in the year. This is all about one thing, and that is trying to win the race tomorrow. Now, in terms of the qualifying itself and the setup, you talked about tire degradation. That is going to be a key, key element of the next couple of sessions. What exactly does that mean? It means how much did the tires start to wear off and thus lose grip on this particular track? One guy that is among those that will navigate that and much more is Felix Rosenquist, and he's with Michael. Former teammate is pitted right next to you, and I saw him trying to do a Greco kind of wrestle move on you. If it were up to you and Pato, if you were in a ring together, who would who would outduel the other? Who was going to be the <laughs> ultimate wrestler or ultimate, I guess, fighter in a ring with the two of you? I mean, I have like 10 pounds on him, so I think I'd win. I mean, he, he's just pissed off he's behind me on pit lane, I think. <laughs> he, doesn't, he never likes being behind in anything, does exactly. he? Yeah. So a little bit about that first session. You guys worked your way through it. There was the, obviously the track issue and a lot of reds. Did you find good flow? Did you find good information? And if so, what? Yeah, it was a bit of a scrappy session for us. Um, just a lot of traffic, a lot of mistakes on my part. So, But we had a really clean day yesterday where... I think the conditions were a little bit more representative. It was pretty cool this morning, so uh, that's why the times went a lot quicker. But, yeah, um, I think overall it's been pretty smooth and we're learning things. We, we have a lot of running, so I feel like now we're at the point where we, we think we're in the window. We just kind of have to see where everyone stack up and when we're out there in anger. But, um, yeah, we'll see how this sandstorm has affected us in the afternoon. So that's exactly what I was going to ask you. So this sandstorm, the wind's picking up. Have you ever been out here where you had any type of wind whatsoever? Do you even know what to expect when you get out there? No, I guess we'll find out in like 10 minutes because we're going to go out and do a long run and see how, you know, try to prep a bit for a race. So, uh, I don't think it's that bad because the sand is super fine. You know, we go to some places where it's like super coarse, but uh, I think honestly after two, three laps when everyone's out there, it's going to be fine. A little bit about the tires, and that's been the theme of this weekend, is tire manageability and, and the drop-off on the tires. How do you feel now going into this final session, knowing the qualifying's coming up, and, and then we go for the million dollars tomorrow? Yeah, it's been a lot of talk about it. I think, I mean, these tires are pretty hard, so uh, they take a bit to warm up. Uh, they have a peak, and then I think actually they stay fairly consistent. Uh, there's been some people reporting a lot of DAG. Uh, we haven't really had that much, but that's why we're doing a long run now just to see what it is because we we just been doing short runs back to back. So uh, I think when you when you're you know pushing the tire lap after lap, it's probably going to DAG quite a bit. But 
Yeah, I guess a big challenge is going to be in the main race, uh, doing 20 laps in one set. That, that's a lot of mileage. That's more than we've ever done, I think, on a, on a tire. So that would be interesting. And uh, it's not exactly like a low deck track either. So, uh, yeah, a big, good, I think, good amount of passing in the end of the race. And I was thinking about that. So, so passing goes, we've never done one of these. There's no points involved. So you either win, you lose, you go home, you take whatever money you can. Do you think... The elbows will be out, and we'll see some pretty fierce racing out there once it comes down to it. Oh, yeah, man. Like, you know, going into this, it was all, like, relaxed and, you know, people having ice creams between practice and stuff. And I just feel like it's it, it, it feels like a normal weekend at this point. You know, we're all competitive, and if someone says otherwise, I think they're lying, to be honest. Like, the game is on for sure. And the ice cream is pretty good as well. It is. <laughs> go. Best of luck the remainder of the day. Good luck at qualifying. Thanks, man. That's Felix Rosenquist, guys. Uh, well, we spent some time talking about him this morning, Jay Query, and uh, I think you and I are two guys that are rooting for him uh, to, to, to follow up what he did at St. Petersburg. I mean, he was competitive all throughout the weekend, ran a really good race for them, and uh, I think a little, I sense a little bit of spring in the step of Felix Rosenquist. Uh, certainly seems uh, much, much happier uh, than, than when we encountered him several times uh, throughout last year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all about chemistry, Jake. Uh, that, that's what it boils down to. And uh, for whatever the reason, things just not pan out for him at, at a couple of previous stops. But, uh, you know, it appears as though he has certainly found a home. And the folks at Meyer Shank are... Very, very happy to have Felix Rosenquist in their fold. You know, just his overall demeanor and his team play, if you will, already make him a desirable guy to have in your paddock. And then I think you combine that with just a natural acumen from a history of being able to drive different cars to be able to give you feedback as to what the car may feel. But now Felix Rosenquist, as we have said on a number of occasions over the last few years, needs results. I mean, that's the reality of it. He is very likable. He is well-liked by his teammates and competitors alike. But he needs to have consistent results. He's won races in this series. He is no doubt talented. He came with a huge resume of a lot of wins overseas. And he has shown the ability to qualify cars well. But then keeping it clean and being able to bring it home is something he needs to be able to consistently do. And I know a lot of people believe, certainly, and are hoping that he can do exactly that only one car that is out on track just far it is stingray rob who is kind of doing an install app looks like he might be getting up to speed just a little bit but that young driver mark taking advantage of right now i wouldn't say a green racetrack because there's probably some dust that has flown over it but certainly a wide open one as of right now not silly season stuff but an announcement of sorts uh, we should mention that uh, it was announced earlier this week uh, and taking a look at the Earl McLaren stable that uh, McLaren racing boss Zach Brown said Friday he signed an extension to remain in charge of that organization through 2030. He's been there since 2018 and uh, he oversees all the McLaren racing program from their England based headquarters and uh, McLaren later confirmed that uh, contract extension at the Australian Grand Prix which is taking place in, in Melbourne. So uh, nice uh, for those folks to, to have that taken care of and uh, that uh, that that's sewn up uh, for the foreseeable future. Going to be interesting to see uh, what this season uh, has in store uh, for teams and drivers because there's a handful of fairly marquee names that uh, are in negotiations and uh, in contract years. And, uh, you know, as, as you know, Jake, from your experience covering the traditional stick and ball sports, uh, sometimes the uh, productivity and the resolve seems to go up a little bit in those contract sure. years. Not that it falls off after that, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's usually uh, the, the case where somebody's trying to send a message to potential suitors, and, and I would think that these drivers would uh, certainly be no exception to that mindset. And another thing to keep in mind, and again, it is not silly season stuff by any stretch of the imagination, but you have with David Malukas being out due to a wrist injury, and perhaps if this was a points race, David Malukas could be out there. I don't know. But he is still recovering from what kept him out of the St. Petersburg race. Contractually speaking, it's my understanding that he does have a minimum number of the points races that he needs to participate um, in terms of his contract. I would assume that that's true of most of these drivers. But for that reason, 
you know, Caleb Eilat, who has done a really nice job, did a good job at St. Petersburg, was the fastest in the session earlier today, and certainly has had a, an acclamation to that race car that is to the benefit of the team and to Caleb Eilat himself. Eilat filling in this week, and then you have to wonder, more time for Malukas to get healthy by the time we get to Long Beach, and I think probably anticipates that he will be in that ride. But Mark, what a luxury to have a guy like Callum Eilat right there who is ready to get in the race car if need be, if David Malukas, the promising young driver, is not able to go. Uh, Eilat obviously is very comfortable with that car, and I think the team likes the results they're getting out of him. Not an ideal situation for him in terms of, you know, he'd much rather be in the series full time, but. Uh, but let's face it. I mean, uh, given the fact that I, I don't know that the, I don't know that the list of options are as lengthy as they have been in years past in terms of those drivers that have been in the series that are currently without rides that would be on the short list for most teams. Uh, but I, I think he 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 might be a guy that uh, you know gets a phone call. We we don't want it to happen, but he you know this might not be the only opportunity right. he gets this year. We'll see. Michael Young. Scott McLaughlin's uh, Expel Chevrolet has just made its way to pit lane. So the wind's kicked up. We have no idea what's going to happen out there. It's kind of a, for the rest of this weekend, I think it, it could potentially be a free-for-all. Yeah, I mean, thankfully we had, you know, good hours, a couple of hours testing now. Now probably everyone's going to get into, like, the, the mode of the Million Dollar Challenge. You know, we've used the last couple of days testing and whatnot. Now we've got an idea where our cars are at, and it's just a matter of just put dialing them up. The wind's completely different. It's going to make the car balance very different. So it's really a big reset right now. For the hybrid, we're thinking Mid-Ohio is when it'll be introduced. So you're learning for races up to Mid-Ohio. Yeah. What were you able to garner from this? Does this course lend itself to really learning about Birmingham, perhaps Long Beach, something of that nature? It's just, uh, it's also for me, like just getting some cadence in the car. And, you know, we missed half a day at Sebring. So like it's sort of really like, I felt a little underdone going into St. Pete. Um, you know, I think we've learned a couple of little things. A lot of corners here are very different to the others, so we're setting up for some corners and setting up for others, and then we finally put it together that last session, and we we're up the front. So, yeah, we've learned a few things, but at the same time, like, you're just trying to get laps in the car and, and be comfortable again in this, in this uh, 2024 rocket ship. And we get to tomorrow. The weather's going to be cool. What do you anticipate? everybody's mentality to be like you have to make it in that six or you're going you're done so what is the mentality going to be like look i think uh, big big emphasis is going to be on qualifying tonight um and then tomorrow i think you'll see in the heat races it's probably going to be like you know eight seventh six fifth we'll be battling very hard um and then if you can somehow manage to get in that top three and qualifying and be able to just start and get away with the other guys and start somewhere at the front that'll be a good thing We'll let you get ready. Keep her out front. Yeah, I'll try. There you go. That's Scott McLaughlin, guys. Uh, hard to believe uh, this is, uh, I, I know it's not a points-paying race, but be that as it may, we're looking, you know, over 50 starts now, uh, Jake, for Scott McLaughlin. And uh, what's interesting about it is, that uh, you know, the next time he gets to victory lane, which we think will be sometime soon, uh, that will be win number five to go along with five poles. Uh, next one will be his sixth, obviously, but uh, that's a pretty decent percentage with a guy with just over 50 starts under his belt. And in addition to that, Mark, the race is that if he doesn't get a win, he is more often than not running right towards the front where it seems as though he would be in contention to get one. Talked to somebody from Penske over the course of the offseason that said, we saw something in him at a very, very early stage that showed that he was special and that he is poised to make a big step. And we'll see if that comes this year for Scott McLaughlin. No reason to believe it would not. Uh, to your point, uh, 51 starts going into St. Petersburg. And at that time, four wins, 17 top fives. This speaks to your point. 31 top tens to go along with those five poles that he's led 558 laps. Now, his first year... He only made eight starts, so he's 35th in the points. And then in 2021, it was a learning campaign for him, obviously, and he finished 14th in the points. Uh, the last two years, he's finished fourth, he's finished third, and if that progress continues, either runner-up or a championship in the, in the, Mark, in the points. Mark, finishing 14th in a learning year speaks for itself, that's does right. it not? I mean, that's very impressive. Well, By that the way, you're very similar for him. 
and his race strategist, Kyle Boyer and Ben Brett's put in company, very similar to what they went through with Simon Pagino a few Agreed. years before. Totally Simon agree. did not set the world on fire his first year with Team Penske, but that second year, I think he picked up the pace. The race car setups were different for him. He got acclimated to it, and then you saw what happened from there. By the way, on the racetrack right now at Thermal Kyle Kirkwood, yeah, good news. that would be by necessity probably because of the fact that the track is open. A lot of teams deciding not to go out just yet in these windy conditions, but Kirkwood, Mark, he lost some time at the end of that practice session with the incident that happened between turns eight and nine. So obviously wanting to see where the car is and make up for lost time. So Kyle Kirkwood is doing exactly that. His best time so far, his last lap that he just turned was a 142.7. Now that's still about, um, what, some four and a half seconds off of what the best time was turned earlier. But totally different conditions. And of course, probably somewhat of an install lap taking place still for Kyle Kirkwood, just two laps turned. Stingray Rob, the only other that has been out so far in this session. Yeah, we, we just got to look at his in-car camera view. When he climbed back into the throttle off the turn, the rear end stepped out on him a little bit, and he had to gather him back in, which he was able to do. And uh, a similar scenario unfolding for Stingray Rob. And uh, on one of the corners, he got uh, to driver's left of those rumble strips when he got it in there a little bit too hot. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a find-out session for Kyle Kirkwood. He's... Uh, they just want to make sure that they got everything squared away and buttoned up. I mean, they didn't feel like that there was anything to be overly concerned about after that off that he had. We could see that clearly there was some uh, some damage to the rear wing. Michael Young spoke of uh, damage to the attenuator, and we had a lengthy conversation with Kyle afterwards. And what I'm boiled down to is there was, you know, 15 to 16 minutes left in the session, Jake. And uh, so given that, there was no reason for them to rush through and and bolt back on what needed to be bolted back on and get in a hurry and maybe realize that they had missed something, had to get all the gravel out of it, first and foremost. And uh, Plus, they knew they had the benefits of two more hours this afternoon. Yeah, I'll tell you another thing that is interesting in terms of, you know, taking advantage of the benefits of this session. Mark, a guy that we're not used to seeing necessarily being one of those, and, and this may just simply be, you know, Scott Dixon's back out on track now as well, but Joseph Newgarden had a really busy first session in terms of number of laps turned in and yet didn't find himself in the top 20 in overall speeds. Now, do we know exactly what he was working on? We do not. Can we rule out the fact that he might have been working on a different driving line than anybody else like I noticed he did last year, for example, on Carb Day leading into the Indianapolis 500 and didn't have great speeds but had his car basically dialed in wherever he wanted to go that may be possible but that said joseph newgarden is out on the track right now and considering that you have kyle kirkwood stingray rob the only other two that have turned laps curious to see what newgarden might be working on and trying to figure out as now his teammate will power joins him on track as well and again just a handful of cars out early on in this session we expect as we move through this two-hour session business will start to pick up a little bit well again a segment that we hope you've enjoyed throughout the course of last year and this year is first to the flag where we catch up with an ntt indycar series driver and take a look at their first ever career win in the ntt indycar series nick yeoman goes back to 2021 to relive when pato award got to victory lane for the first time this is First to the Flag, a chance to catch up with the stars of the NTT IndyCar Series and share their stories, insights, and experiences about their first major open wheel victory. Here's Nick Yeoman. Hello, and thanks for joining us for a special presentation from the IndyCar Radio Network. I'm Nick Yeoman. This is First to the Flag, where we sit down with some of IndyCar's best drivers to take a look back at their first career IndyCar win with radio broadcast highlights helping to tell the story. Today on First of the Flag, we look back at May 2nd, 2021 for the running of the Expel 375 at Texas Motor Speedway. The 248-lap race just outside of Dallas-Fort Worth marked the 27th time IndyCar would race at No Limits, Texas, and for just the second time since 2011, IndyCar would race twice on the mile-and-a-half oval in the same weekend. Saturday's first race would be dominated by IndyCar legend Scott Dixon as the New Zealand driver would lead 206 of 212 laps en route to his fifth IndyCar win at Texas. For most of the teams, the first race functioned as a glorified test session in hopes of putting up a better fight against Dixon in Sunday's second race. And one of those drivers was 20-year-old Patricio Award from Monterey, Mexico. 
Pato's Aero McLaren SP team would steadily improve the car Saturday, allowing him to charge from 11th starting position to finish third. And that left the driver and team confident they could challenge Dixon for the win in race number two. 24 cars would take the green flag at Texas Motor Speedway for the 2021 Expel 375, but only 18 of them would even make it to turn one as chaos ensues at the start of the event. Guide in right behind him. Here they come, Mark, for the start of uh, green right now. Ooh, green crash flag on the front is front out, right. and cars we everywhere already right now. have. Crashes oh. all down the front. Car upside down. We have a lot of cars involved in an incident right as the green flag flies, Nick Yeoman. Yep, the car that got upside down is Connor Daly, but it looks like Sebastian Bourdais is involved. Alexander Rossi's car is destroyed. Dalton Kellen is involved. Again, the major concern was for Connor Daly, whose car's got upside down. We do see Connor moving around in that cockpit. The good news, Mark, is this was a low-speed accident right at the start of the event, but still a ton of carnage. Ed Jones's car is missing a couple wheels. This was, it looked like, Mark, about three-quarters of the way, the back of the pack, and uh, Pietro Fittipaldi, his day is done. The left rear tire torn off of that car, just absolute carnage at the back of the field. All drivers involved in the opening lap accident would walk away unhurt, but the days would be done for Connor Daly, Dalton Kellett, Ed Jones, Pietro Fittipaldi, Alexander Rossi, and Sebastian Bourdais. The wreck happened behind fourth place starting Patricio Award, but the Mexican driver admitted it got his attention when the field drove back around. Uh, I was focused forward on turn one. Um, when I saw yellow, 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 we were just, we weren't even like to the exit of turn two. Uh, but then I turned and looked at the screens and I saw like a replay of a car flying. I was like, oh, that's not good. And then when we came back into the, we were driving through the pit lane and then I saw a bunch of cars right there, which uh, which definitely wasn't a sight that you'd like to see. After a wild start, you'd assume that perhaps the remaining drivers would be a tad cautious, but that was far from the case as fans would be treated to good, clean edge of your seat, wheel-to-wheel -wheel excitement that Texas Motor Speedway has historically been known for. Green flag flies, and Scott Dixon, to, to no one's surprise, gets a really good jump, but it looks like uh, that the Pato Award wants to move around Joseph Newgarden and more. He's going to grab fourth from Newgarden. He's looking for third on Graham Ray Hall. On the outside, he's going to make it stick. Pato Award jumps to third. Further back, Felix Rosenquist. He's feeling a little aggressive. He jumps to the inside. Mark, he'll get around Alex Pelot for six. He snookered Alex Pelot. There's no question about it. I, I don't think Pelot expected him to make that pass, but boy, he did. He looked awfully strong doing it. And now Simon Pagino wants a piece of Alex Pelot as they set up for turn number one. As they roar through turn number one, Pagino will drift about a couple car lengths behind Alex Pelot as they make their way. Man, they are fanning out. Colton Hurd is all the way below the apron. Mark, he's trying to get around Scott McLaughlin. And it's clear, Nick, that they have figured out that if they can get a decent run off of turn number two and they can get to that apron, that's there's still grip down there and they can make a pass. No limits Texas, right? Here comes Marcus Erickson. Mark, he's going to swing to the outside. He is going to get McLaughlin at the entrance to turn number 10. So Erickson lost a spot or two because of that violation on pit road, but he proves he has a fast race car tonight. Had a face, fast race car last night, Nick, until that wheel came off on pit road. And that pass for Marcus Erickson moves him into the 10th position. Here comes Paul Auto Award, Mark, side-by-side side with Will Power in a one. I think he caught him in the right place at the exit of turn number four, and he's able to make that pass stick. So vault the uh, Pato Award into P2. Now he's in pursuit of Scott Dixon. He's six-tenths of a second behind him. Much like the first race of the weekend, Scott Dixon would dominate, leading 163 of 248 laps. But along with Award, another contender would emerge in the form of Joseph Newgarden. And with great final pit stops, Award and Newgarden found themselves ahead of Dixon after the final caution flag flew on lap 190 when the right rear tire fell off of Felix Rosenquist's machine. With 51 laps to go, Newgarden and Award would restart second and third behind Takuma Sato, who was working a different strategy. And if the two wanted to race away from Dixon, they'd have to dispatch of Sato quickly, and the two young guns wouldn't hesitate. Here comes Newgarden to the outside. He wiggles just a little bit as he starts to go to the high side. Takuma Sato is uh, going to stick that car to the bottom of the racetrack. It starts to wash up off of turn number one. Joseph Newgarden goes to P1. Now Pato Award is going to go after Takuma Sato. Sato went to the bottom of the racetrack, Nick. I thought he was coming to pit road. Yeah, Award had to take advantage of that opportunity because Newgarden starts to check out a bit down the front straight. Away. It's Newgarden by eight car lengths. Pato Award knows he has to attack now. 
now he gets to the inside mark. He'll take second away from Takuma Sato. Once clear of Sato, New Garden and O'Ward would set up a late race duel that saw an aggressive move by Pato with just 24 laps to go. Nick Gilman, it looks like if Pato O'Ward is going to make a move, it appears as though he's going to do it either off of two or off of four. And he is wearing the mirrors out on Joseph Newgarden's car. He looked to the outside, looked to the inside, trying to get around Joseph down the back stretch. Now out of turn four, Mark is within a car length as they set up for turn number one. Newgarden, though, once again, protects the inside. Joseph kind of moves up just enough, Nick, at the entrance to turn one to make sure that Pato Award is not going to be bold enough to make that move to the high side. Tim Sendrick talked about nobody can go full rich to the end, but uh, when is that point where they can turn it up? Here comes Pato Award. Markey's going to look to the outside. We've got a race for the lead with 24 to go. Looks awfully strong to the high side. He got a great run off of four, but again, he saw the color of that racetrack change into turn number one, Nick. He had to lift to climb back into the throttle right away. Didn't lose a lot of momentum there. He did. He jumped right back into the throttle. They'll snake their way down the back stretch. Now he's going to look inside and New Garden has to yield. Pato Award swings to the inside. Mark with 23 laps to go. We've got a new race leader. He might have set that up the lap before, Davey, because uh, he gave uh, Joseph the impression that he was going to look to the high side into turn number three. But that time he looked to the low side when he saw Joseph move up to protect that line. Yeah, full send mode because it's there's not a lot of grip up there. So whoever can take the low line is, is going to be the one that takes the grip. So uh, you want to be there before you get to the middle of the of the of the corner um sometimes you just don't have a choice whether to back out or or send it right with the race lead the only concern left for pato award was whether he could make it to the end on fuel and with 14 laps to go awards race strategist taylor kyle confirmed to michael young that the team was in good shape for a goosebump building crescendo to the checkered flag you guys have had an amazingly quick car your driver has been aggressive do you have enough fuel to get to the end yeah i think so i think uh we're just trying to play play the game here, hold the gap to New Garden, take care of our tires, take care of our car, uh, and get to the end. Does Hopefully he have to it. does he have to save anything? Uh, we're managing our gap right now, and that's kind of helping us save. So right now we're looking okay. Ah, oh, goosebumps. Uh, I remember as soon as I passed Joseph, I knew that that was my race. There was no way he was going to get by me because I was just fast. Um, I knew it from the start. I knew I had a great car, so I knew if I could just get up there and and, and save some fuel. Um, as soon as I did that, I knew I, I had it in the bag. So as soon as I got by him, it was just uh, it was just a, a really enjoyable last 20 laps of of uh, I was just trying to be as precise as I could. And, and the goosebumps were building more every lap. It was it was a really cool feeling. Uh, six laps to go for Pato Award and uh, Nick Yeoman. He's one of those guys that uh, you know you and I have had the pleasure for years to cover the road to Indy. Uh, along with the NGT IndyCar Series. And, uh, you know, when he first made a splash onto the scene, uh, he, we've seen it happen over the years where guys come along and they look like can't miss. But uh, I, I, I don't think he's done anything at all uh, to, to, to make me feel, make us feel as though that uh, we hyped him up too much. He is indeed the real deal. Yeah, it's been a, a sensational ride for Pato Award, winning that Lights Championship. And you think about it, Mark, in this now uh, one full season and now four races with Errol McLaren SP how many near misses you know came so close to winning a race at road america a couple years or last year uh the start of the season at barber motorsports park sat on pole and the, the pit strategy just didn't work out he has been so darn close mark to that first win and now he is three and a half laps away from doing it here at texas motor speedway davy obviously a solid race team with a lot of resources and i think they showed a lot of faith in uh, in in, in putting a, a driver as young as Pato Ward uh, in, in the cockpit. And uh, obviously they saw a lot of talent in this kid, and it has really paid dividends for him at the start of the season. And we always wondered where Pato was going to end up, right off out of the Indy Lights, winning a couple championships, looking so strong, had a couple opportunities in, in IndyCar, turned them down, actually, a few of them, one of them to be with the Andretti team, and then didn't get a ride, and we thought, man, is that the end of it for, for Pato Ward? But, boy, right at the right time, this McLaren team has stepped up. They found a young guy that felt that maybe even has Formula One hopes, and they could put him right in a Formula One car as well. And uh, But right now, he's proven that he is the guy 
week in, week out. He's always a contender. We talk about him a lot, and uh, he is due for a win. It looks like this, today's going to be his day. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot more turns uh, to pull off flawlessly to make it happen. Nick Yeoman, the white flag is in the hands of the starter, and this outstanding young talent, Pato Award, set sail into turn number one. The lead is 1.4 seconds over Joseph Newgarden, who we've already had a first-time winner earlier this season, and Alex Below. Here comes Pato Award down the back straightaway, nice and smooth. Mark James for the final time through turns three and four at Texas. Different drivers were dominant on this day, but the driver that was dominant when it counted, young Pato Award. Twin checkers out. He goes to victory lane. He wins the XFL 375 at Texas Motor Speedway. What a great run for you today. Excitement, disbelief, relief. All the emotions in one. Um, a bit of bit, a little bit of relief. A wind speed, pardon me, at 17 miles an hour. So if that's sustained, that's certainly a stiff breeze. But maybe there's some gusts. It's certainly proving to be an extra challenge for these guys with an hour and 24 left on the clock before we switch over into qualifying mode. And it's a challenge for the engineers as well. You know, you set the gear ratios for a, a track. You see Cole just sawing at the wheel, the 26. You set the gear ratios based on wind direction and velocity being a certain thing. If then all of a sudden there's a shift, again, you can have that greatly affect the gears that you select. And that's why we heard Kalamilot there just all over the hard limiter. That means he's reached the maximum allowable RPM for the engine is limited by the rules. And an electronic limiter comes and stops the engine from turning any faster than 12,000 RPM. It's cold a little bit wide there. You could just gets onto that exit curb. And the left front just has no grip. Too much understeer, he says. And back to the pit box for Colton. Plus two, we don't know like what kind of fine layer of sand is out there on the track with this very strong uh, wind. You know, it's kind of what would it be similar to Bahrain. The Sakia circuit, um, La Salle, Qatar, you know, any of those desert based tracks where the wind blows in and uh, you have to deal with it, whether it's F1 or MotoGP or sports cars. Uh, here we are in the desert, the California desert, uh, dealing with it here, Marty. Diff, one of the coolest things about this racetrack is there's literally an, an airport less than a mile from here and the planes go right over pit road to make a landing and this really doesn't show it quite so much but these planes are having to crab so much hence just to land and these crazy winds are having right now here that uh, they're literally flying sideways into the runway it's it's wild to watch it and uh we'll have to get sean owens to get an amazing shot next time one comes in that was the first brave guy since the dust storm to land but i'm sure they're all up there circling wanting to come to pit, come and come uh come and land here at the airport cab this is as stiff a wind as i have felt on pit lane in a long time texas motor speedway comes to mind sometimes on a friday afternoon practice let's listen to what Greg Sam Rahal is talking about on the 15 RLL radio. Pretty slippery out here. Yeah, the wind's blowing dust across the track. Now, just got another uh, scanner report uh, that Callum Isla, I did not hear Callum specifically say this, but conversation that Callum says the track is not too bad right now. So going back to what you were saying, Lee, kind of wondering what that film of dust is, at least for one guy who's pretty quick, says uh, it's OK. Still seems pretty treacherous to me with that wind for the moment. Yeah. And how is it going to be come qualifying time when you've really got to lay one down uh, to give yourself the best possible spot for either of tomorrow's heats. Oh, big understeer there from Will Powers trying to get on the power. The front tires just not gripping. You see him turning the wheel, but it's not changing the trajectory of the car and just pushes right off into the dirt there. So this is interesting because again, we've been running around for hours. These drivers have had seven hours of practice up to this point. And now the track completely changes. The conditions completely change right before we're heading into qualifying when it actually starts mattering. It actually starts counting. And that's going to throw a lot of these drivers and engineers for a loop. How much do we change the car? We had a decent balance this morning. Now the tracks change. Are we chasing those conditions? Is the wind going to change again before qualifying? This is when you really earn your money as an engineer trying to predict what the track and what the conditions are going to be. Oh, here we go. Look at this. <laughs> Ooh, and that one's a little smaller than the last one. He's got less weight to keep him going straight, but you can see the crab in it. 
I bet, you know, the, the Roskies and Grosjeans, the pilots in the field are standing on pit wall watching these pilots work their magic. I actually had to do a landing like that with Rossi once. It was terrifying. Yeah, it's not fun. He killed it, though. Here's one for you when we're specifically talking testing mode, okay? Engineering um, objectives are set out uh, for the day. You like the workload, right? Your checklist, what you want to get done. Help the folks at home understand from a driver's point of view, can you put in a request to the engineers and say, hey, I know that's what you'd like us to get done. I'd like to work on something just for the next five laps. Can you request that as a driver? Absolutely, absolutely you can. 50-50 on whether or not they give it to you, but uh, they give you the time <laughs> to do it. Very, yeah, it's very negotiable because, again, you know, a lot of track time, but not a ton of tire uh, sets for the amount of track time that the team's had this weekend, especially when you consider, you know, the high rate of degradation means that every change that you make, it can be clouded by the fact that the tires degrade so much run to run. As we take another look back here at Linus Lindquist, Chasing the car a little bit. Here's into 15. This is where we saw Colton going a little wide and same deal, just too much speed in. Probably a tailwind down that back straightaway. Marcus Erickson, same spot of the racetrack, same result. Told us he was going to work on this section of the track around a 16 and 17. This is what it sounded like. Definitely has definitely has characteristics of being pushed in there, doesn't it? Just getting that extra wind from behind and just getting shoveled over the edge, that's for sure. So Pato Award is the quickest in this session, but times don't really mean anything at the moment. As far as outright pace, they're not representative of what has been laid down so far by Callum Eilat and this man here, actually in the 10, Alex Pelot, over the course of the weekend. But we will be talking about speed a lot more importantly as we get closer to the conclusion of this session and closer to that qualifying session. This will be an interesting one to watch, Alex Below. He has been very quick at the top of both sessions yesterday, was in the top three this morning. And he thinks, again, the car is pretty solid. We've seen him at this type of race circuit be so, so dominant in the past. We talked this morning about how good he is to his tires. That's definitely going to be an advantage, but he's just completed his first flyer. I'm curious to see what kind of time he gets down to, but he goes wide. He gets that rear locking going into turn two. It's going to be tough to string this, a lap together, Dan. This is, going to, this is going to put a seed of doubt. If This is if the weather conditions don't change between now and 5 o'clock local, 8 p.m. Eastern, when we have our qualifying coverage for you. By the way, over the course of the weekend, we've had a chance to meet many of the Thermal Club members who have been so gracious, so generous, uh, along with Tim Rogers, uh, the man behind this amazing facility, to allow us here and enjoy our time. And Townsend and I were out and about this morning on the golf cart and happened to go over to what I think is my, what I enjoy the most on this track, the 10 through 13 section, the really fast S's. And that's where T-Bell is now perched up on a beautiful veranda with what I think is the best view on the track. Townsend, take it away. Oh, Diff, you're not kidding. I am so glad that we um, introduced ourselves, let's say, this morning on our little <laughs> golf cart ride. Our new friends, Greg, his absolutely adorable wife, Na, have welcomed us into their 10,000 square foot private home here at Thermal. And you said it best, this is the spot. I am looking down on Indy cars going 165 miles an hour just below me, and the wind at this height, we're about 50 feet off the ground, is ripping. I would guess it's about 20 knots or 25 miles an hour for you non-sailors. And what that means is the Indy cars are going 165 across the ground, but they're reading 190 aerodynamically. So the amount of stick that they have with downforce going into the most challenging section, one of them on the track, is insane. Conversely, when they go the other direction, like all the guys running off at the exit of turn two, they're losing 20, 25 miles an hour worth of downforce going over the body of the car. So it's really fascinating to stand here because the commitment level is insane as you fire it into these S's with all of that downforce. For us non-sailing types, I appreciate you doing that math conversion <laughs> for us. <laughs> oh, you're no stranger to a boat hitch. <laughs> yeah, I, I ain't driving it though, so that's. <laughs> but that is a, that is an incredible view, man. I mean, 
That's the, for me, that's the coolest part of the racetrack. And like you say, if you've got the headwind going in there, it just gives the drivers, you feel like Superman. You just have that extra downforce from that headwind, pins the front down, makes it really responsive. Hey, Hinch, the other thing I just noticed, Roman Grosjean just went blasting through here, and you can tell that his, the bottom, his floor, is rubbing where I don't think it was this morning, and that is also the result of going into the headwind, right? So at 190 miles an hour of airspeed, the compression on the springs is that much more aggressive, and therefore your dynamic ride height is, is a lot lower than any engineer would probably plan for. So Townsend, tell me this, you're standing up there. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a single lane through that section as we just take a quick replay here. And Romain Grosjean having that issue of that loss of downforce with the tailwind behind him. But it, it looks like a pretty, you know, simple line through that section. But are you seeing a, a deviation in drivers, how they approach turn 10 to set up more for 11, to set up more for 12, et cetera? Or is it pretty straightforward and standard across the field? Well, I would say it's a pretty standard line, but, whoa, you know. Whoa. Christian Rasmussen might, sorry to no, interrupt. I saw that. Rasmussen's Car's off. Coming. And That's he's probably gonna, gonna be a red. It's you're high clear, center. you're going, clear. Yeah, he can't go anywhere, he's stuck. I'm stuck. So I believe this is down into that turn two section again that we've seen. Oh no, this is maybe turn six. So it stepped out twice. He caught it the first time, it went again, and then it was just too much. Yeah, it's that 2-3 section. We've seen a, a lot of drivers have issues there. Some rear locking, fighting it in. Townsend, what's the view from down there? Well, I was just circling back up on your question, James, in terms of line, and I talked with Felix Rosenquist over at the IndyCar Driver Lounge, which we're gonna get to next in this show when we get over there. And he just said thermal is, he said he loves the track, but he says it requires such precision. He said he's not, a, not aware of any other track he's ever been to where precision is rewarded, or maybe more importantly, it's penalized if you aren't precise. And that's the, the trick with the technique here in the S's is that if I see the slightest little bobble or mistake on the way into the S's, it just carries the penalty all the way through. It's a, a classic sacrifice corner in racing where one leads to the next to the next. So if you just push it a little too much on entry, you pay for it in massive loss of lap time. And that's the case all the way around when these guys are sliding wide in turn two. I mean, you're losing probably, what, two seconds by running over into that uh, very low grip sealant runoff. So. Uh, drivers are going to be on their toes this afternoon, especially with this win, to qualify up front for the heat races tomorrow. Well, while Townsend is still there at that beautiful house, just judging by what I've seen and read on social media and various things, there's a lot of interest with IndyCar being here, non-championship points race for the first time since 2008, but also in the facility and the surrounds and these magnificent uh, residences and second homes and, and what have you. With the folks where Townsend is there, uh, Greg and Nah. Uh, there are a couple who have worked very hard in life and, and been successful, but not necessarily big motorsport people. Uh, the, uh, Greg's wife is into golf, and she plays down the road here, and he said, well, I'd like to do something cool as well. Or how about we go up here? And he's not a massive motorsport guy, but likes nice cars. So it's not necessarily racing people who choose to be uh, club members. They, they may be, they may not be, and, and we, we've seen both sides of that here. Kev? Hey, Lee, since we've talked to all 27 drivers participating this weekend, it's time to start getting some we'll see in a car at other times this year. We talked to Jack Harvey yesterday, and Connor Daly is going to be with Dreyer and Ryan Bold and Cusick Motorsports in the number 24 car for the Indianapolis 500. Before we talk about that, let's talk about this. You've been here before. What would this be like right now with this, this wind? Not just gusts, but a steady wind. That's nightmare fuel. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's maximum confusion before qualifying. I mean, these guys have had a pretty pretty decent days weather wise uh, you know it's a little hot yesterday but today uh, when this wind kicks up there's so many medium speed and high speed corners here that uh, you're very very wind dependent uh, and you're really trying to pin the pin the nose with the wind but then all of a sudden if you get that wind to go away uh, you're seeing a lot of cars go off with basically their entire front 
wheel lock at maximum because they've lost all front grip. So it's uh, it's going to be a difficult one for them out there for sure. So let's combine the wind and higher high tire degradation. How difficult is that if you say are 13, 14 laps into a stint? Well, it's great for us watching. Yeah. Uh, great for spectators. Uh, you know, it just creates a little bit more chaos. I mean, trying to find the balance uh, mechanically is super important, but you rely so much on the arrow in these cars uh, in, in this era for sure uh, that that you just create a question mark. You create, did we make the right change? Like, yeah. did, are, are we doing the right thing for qualifying? Because this is your last time you get to to, to evaluate anything before qualifying. So I, everyone's in a tough spot right now. You don't want to overthink yourself. Overthinking is your enemy right now. Let's talk oval racing now. We're going to see you back in a car really soon, April 10th and 11th. That's going to be on Peacock for the open test at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And I suspect you're okay with this. Let's roll a highlight of you leading the greatest spectacle in racing. You have uh, been strong so many years there. New situation for you. What are you expecting? Well, honestly, I mean, last last couple of years being in the top 10 there and, and having a couple of my best races really over the last three years in general has been super confidence inspiring. I mean, you know, that, that crowd, by the way, come on now that year in particular, we didn't even finish that great because we had no front end on the thing that was left after we punted a tire 60 yards away. So, um, you know, we, we I feel good there. This is also going to be the first time in four years that I've driven a different, you know, a different package, a, a different team, a different car there. So it'll be different. But, you know, Don Cusick is out here. He's uh, been, been spending a lot of time with him. He's part of our effort. Uh, we're going to have a really cool primary sponsor that we're going to announce hopefully soon before the test. Yeah. Uh, which is going to be really, really nice. And I just can't wait to drive. It's, uh, it is really painful not being a racing driver and being a content creator. But shout out to the IndyCar content office right now. Everyone's doing an incredible job in their offices over there. We're putting out some great stuff. If you haven't seen it, please go to the internet, IndyCar, and uh, check out what we've done. I think it's been a lot of fun. So that shows you really are a content creator, getting <laughs> that in there. Connor Daly, back in a car soon. Townsend. Oh, thanks, Kevin. I, I just want to learn a little bit more about our lovely host up here, Mr. Greg Goldfinch. And Greg, your place is spectacular, but the location is even better. Help us understand how you discovered Thermal and what the process was like to, to become a member. How'd this all go down? You know, we uh, came out here a few years ago and looked around and um, I kind of got excited about it. And then it took a couple of years to convince us to really come out here and do this. And uh, when we found this lot, we knew we'd had uh, one of the better lots. And so we said, let's, let's, let's jump in. And we did, and then built a house that was fitting to the lot. And as you can see, the views are just spectacular. and They really are. And you were just pointing out that you're on the leading edge of the weather front, typically, on this property. So you can inform the other 200 members and homeowners what's about to happen. What do you see as you look to the west? I see it's clearing a little bit. There's no uh, dust in the air. And uh, it's a little brighter. So still could be a little wind, but uh, not as bad as it was a little earlier. So guys, in Indianapolis, we've got, you know, Marty and Terre Haute. And at Thermal, we've got Greg. Greg, thanks for having us. A lovely home. Really appreciate your hospitality. Thank you all for being here, and we're glad to have you guys here. I hope it works out sensational for everybody. Thank you. Guys? Well, it's just um, continues the, the learning and the story of the weekend. I mean, there's, there are numerous uh, private motorsport clubs around the world. But I don't know for you, Hinch, I've never seen anything like this. And it's lovely to meet the members and their respective stories. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you and I were having this chat earlier. The, the quality and just the level of everything here is higher than pretty much any place I've been to. It's, uh, it is super, super impressive. And, and everyone here is just, as you say, welcomed us with open arms. And it was fun to come here last year for the spring training test. And it's even more exciting to be here now with all these guys going for a nice big paycheck at the end of the day. Townsend had the remark yesterday that hey, there could be as Alexander Rossi goes to the top. You're looking at Kiffin Simpson, the rookie here. Let's go on board with Rossi. Uh, T. Bell had a comment yesterday that hey, there could be 50 cents on the line in a, in a parking lot with you know shopping carts, shopping trolleys, and these guys that race each other as fiercely as ever. Uh, do you concur? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, you, you go indoor go karting, you know, rental go karting with a group of these guys, and it's all you know all hands on deck no holds barred going like it's the last lap of the 500 that's just how racing drivers are wired competition is what fuels them and so i, I completely agree it could be uh, you know 50 cents in a lollipop and you're still going to get a fierce battle out front but mclaren really showing up in a big way one two five right now and they've been consistently quick 
Right from the first session, Rossi was up there in the top five. We've seen Callum up there quite a bit. Pato's had the pace as well, so this team definitely strong. Polo, we talked about him going out. He got it into the top five, so again, consistently quick. As Newgarden jumps up there as well, so again, all three Penske's in the top eight. Talking with Brian Barnhart, who you hear on the radio all the time with Alexander Rossi as we look at the mission food on board here. Um, Brian said yesterday one thing that's been perplexing them that they need to get on top of uh, on this seven car sooner rather than later is qualifying position. You know, Alex is an enormously talented driver, Indy 500 winner, championship contender, but there's only so many times you can dig from behind, right? You've got you to be up there. And, and uh, he just said, I'm not sure where we're missing, what we're missing, but one of those prioritized starting spots would sure would be nice. You can see him, he's doing a little bit of prep with his tires right now. I wonder if he's going for another shot at it. Rena's VK has just laid down an absolutely stonking time. 39-3, nine tenths of a second faster than Rossi did just a few moments ago. But yeah, to your point, Diff, I mean, that was the big Achilles heel in 2023 for the seven car. Uh, St. Pete, they had an issue, they caught some traffic. So again, they didn't have the best starting spot, did a great job to move up six spots, what was otherwise a tough race to progress in. So if they start sorting out their Saturdays, that could definitely be a force to be reckoned with. Rossi working with the new engineer this year and Chris Lawrence, but it's this, that guy there in pit lane, Renus VK, that's currently setting the pace. Push to pass, we've been told, is available for the drivers to practice using that over a lap because that is allowed in qualifying for the first time when we qualify later this afternoon, which is going to be exciting to see. And I'm told it's a lot of push to pass. They have 160 seconds available in this session, no more than 40 at a time. And kind of the guesstimate is if you wanted to use it where it's useful for a lap, it's about 35 seconds. So. That's what you're going to see in qualifying. What you think is your best lap, you're basically on the button almost the entire time in the straightaways. It resets. It resets every time you head back to pit lane. So uh, it gets rejuvenated, reloaded, and ready to go. Tom Blomquist moves into second place with a 139.6. That's good for the Maya Shank Honda driver. Nice work. BK Blomquist, Rossi Award. Power, that's a very different looking top five at the moment. Yes, still only testing, still only practice, but we are taking one step closer towards qualifying. 5 p.m. local, 8 p.m. Eastern, live here on Peacock, wherever you're watching. We will set the field for tomorrow's two heat races, which lead into the big one, the 20 lap, two part million dollar challenge. Remember, qualifying is split into two groups. That was done by random draw. You know, normally in a race weekend, we do it based on practice times. This was a random draw. So maybe not quite as even as you would aim to have on a normal race weekend by just doing odds and evens from a practice session. It does seem like group one's a little more stacked and qualifying for group one will be the heat one race. Qualifying for group two will be the heat two race. And Let's take a look at those groups right now. Let's see, it's a pretty, it's, it is a heavy, heavy group one. All three Penske's, you've got Kirkwood and Colton Herta. You've got Scott Dixon. You've got Grosjean, who's been very quick. Christian Lundgaard has been very quick. Renus VK, who's the quickest at the moment. We actually did the math on this. Russ Thompson, our Senior Vice President of Data Analytics. Group one wins and polls. There's 142 wins and 142 polls in group one. Group two, 31 wins <laughs> from 21 polls. Just a, a slight difference there. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, that is a <laughs> heavily, heavily unweighted split of the groups, but that's not to say that that's not really the whole story because a young driver who could be particularly quick here this weekend sure. only has a handful of wins to his name, like say a Pato Award, you know, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with here, but might not be contributing the 56 victories that a Scott Dixon is to that tally. So for the second year in a row, Hinch, this guy here, Pato Award has started with a second place at the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Pete. You're a winner of that Grand Prix at St. Pete. What does a win or a podium that early in the season 
big picture, it may mean nothing. That could be, we've seen drivers podium at the first race and they don't podium for the rest of the year. It doesn't always mean it's, you know, the, the finish of the season's not gonna be uh, the story of, of how it started. But what does that do for you? It's gotta get you like coming to an event like this or getting ready for Long Beach. It's gotta have you, you know, walking pretty high in your shoes, right? You're, yeah. you're feeling good. Certainly, certainly, you know, I think Racing is no different to any other sport. You know, momentum is huge. It uh, it helps get the team in the right mindset, helps give the driver that little bit of confidence that finds you maybe that extra hundredth or two in qualifying when things are just clicking. And things are definitely clicking on the five car right now. They had a super strong St. Pete. Paddle looking very hooked up at the moment on this lap. I don't think this is a quality sim necessarily because I'm not seeing him go for that overtake button. But when you start off with a, a strong result, it, it just, again, it just gets everybody off on the right foot. You know, I think when you have a bad St. Pete, you already feel like you're digging yourself out of a hole, and it's it's never as much fun to sort of have to claw that deficit back. So these guys are off on the right foot. They're off to a great start, and they've got a, a ton of potential. Remember, he backed up his first second place last year with another one at Fast. the second race of the season. Fast man of this session with a 138.6 which is the quickest time of the weekend. Watch Will Power's steering wheel here on the replay. Check this out. Okay, so you saw those, oh, whoa, whoa, wow. Whoa. Tons of curb there, and he's fighting it. You see him move his hand, those little blue lights at the side of the dash, that's his push to pass. He was trying to do everything. The Penske cars have been very good over the curbs. I've noticed that this weekend. And he even, you know, he went quickest with that lap. There's a few tenths lost just right there, Diff. But what was interesting to me was watching them try to get back to the push to pass button, Marty. It's going to be such a challenge for these drivers constantly having to go to the OT. Yeah, that was a simulated qualifying run for Will Power and also Scott McLaughlin, his teammate who's right behind him, went out on sticker tires. Joseph Newgarden has not made that move yet. But interesting, one thing that's kind of surprised me a little bit, Hinch, is that some drivers are hitting that quick lap in lap two. Some are hitting it in lap three. I thought everybody, everybody kind of thought it would be two laps who would hit that fast lap, but some are taking until lap three before they hit that optimal lap. And that depends on a lot of different things. I mean, car setup, driver style, driver preference even sometimes. You can prep the tires for a lap, take it nice and slow, just build a little bit of heat into it before you push flat out. Other drivers, they like leaving the pit box, taking off PLC and driving 10 tenths around to the line to start a flyer immediately. Some of it is definitely driver preference, but some of it is also just how the car is set up. This young man here from Denmark, Christian Rasmussen, the Indy Next champion of last year and IndyCar rookie this year. Just the one IndyCar race under his belt so far. Didn't finish the way that he wanted to. Uh, and he was racing without a clutch for the majority of the race, which was brutally uh, challenging for him. Uh, he said there's there's a checklist of things that he'd like to improve on and do different, but he was pleased with himself that he didn't do anything crazy or silly. He said, but I do already know where I can improve the most, and that's in qualifying. I need to ask more of myself. I need to deliver more. How hard is IndyCar qualifying, especially on a street course? You, you got to think. He goes into St. Pete the first time he's ever trying the alternate tires is in first practice. Second time is when it counts in qualifying. You're going up against drivers with decades of experience doing that. That's a huge ask for a rookie, and especially at a street course where any small mistake, you know, you look at how many times you see drivers drive over the curbs or drop a wheel here, that would be the end of a session at St. Pete. So you've got to be a bit measured in your approach there, here. You can really, really push the car without much penalty and start learning a little bit about what you need, what the car needs, what the tire needs. Obviously, we don't have the alternates here this weekend, but still, fresh set of tires, low fuel, one or two laps to get it done. It's that process, that procedure, that pressure that he can really work on and practice here this weekend. Let's go for a ride with Graham Rahal. Pretty nice jump to P6. Yeah, great little jump there from Graham. From 15. 
Oh man, they are getting so close to flat out through turn 17. Finish your lap and pit. Finish your lap and pit. This is a Chevrolet dominated session at the moment. Power McLaughlin, Eilat, one, two, three, four. Add VK to that, one, two, three, four, before you pick up a Honda with Tom Blomquist. I mean, the uh, power downs is not good enough. Um, it's so independent, man. The understeer and free is so, so high um, with pretty poor entry and loose exit, but the understeer level from the wind on the side of the car is terrible. Uh, but then the under, uh, the power down, out of all the hairpins, it's awful. It's, it's great feedback from Graham there on that in lap to give the engineers a head start on, on what changes they want to make. And so, yeah, that tailwind into turn three, it makes the rear of the car light on the entry because that wind is essentially trying to lift the back of the car up. But then as soon as you start turning, you're broadside of the wind and it just pushes the car out so the front end doesn't work. That's the understeer he's talking about. That's all kind of wind related. The power down, he says it's out of all the hairpins. So to me, that's just a fundamental setup issue with that 15 car. 54 minutes left in this session before a break of a couple of hours. And then we head into qualifying mode. And speaking of in the mode, Malibu Barbie, a.k.a. Townsend Bell, feels right at home at this luxurious facility. Hey, listen, you need to get off the Malibu Barbie and start getting on the thermal Townsend train because <laughs> this is my new home. This place is so fantastic. We are up above the racetrack in a completely different location. I mean, thermal just has everything. This for this weekend is the IndyCar Driver Lounge. James, you and I know that we've had plenty of soggy ham sandwiches <laughs> at places that are not exactly amenity rich. This is totally different. This is exclusive for just the drivers and a few fine celebrities who have made their way up here. I see Oriol Servia and Troy Lee uh, having a cocktail at the bar back there. Probably not Servia. He's got to drive the pace car tomorrow. There is a prosciutto slicer. That's right. It's not pre-sliced. It is freshly sliced right here. And luckily, we've got Mark Miles, the CEO of Penske Entertainment. And Mark, this has been something that's been building IndyCar Thermal for a couple of years, a couple of years now. But the vibe this weekend is incredible for the Million Dollar Challenge. You just, you just got here. What do you, what do you think when you walk in? What do you see? What do you hear? It was like uh, building off of last year, and I've only been here a little while. But every single person you see says this is the coolest place, and they don't even know about the prosciutto. You're right. That's straight from uh, Northern Italy. No, the, the people, uh, the family that runs this place and their whole team are committed to being great hosts and they know racing. So everybody's made to feel like a VIP, VVIP. And uh, from what I gather, all of the paddock and, and, and certainly all the, the IndyCar team feels great about being here. It's, among other things, it's gorgeous. Everything is high quality and it's fun. So people love the vibe. It's absolutely amazing. I'm having fun seeing it. Thanks for making this possible. We hope this is the first of many years here at Thermal as the nine car Scott Dixon just got backwards here on the racetrack. And let's take a look. I'm not sure if this is replay or live shot. I think that's live shot. He's back going. Let's take a look at a replay here. Dixon approaching turn eight. This is where the big bump is. It's caught out so many. Kyle Kirkwood, Pietro Fittipaldi. And leave it to the uh, the grandmaster here, Scotty Dixon, the six-time champion, keeps his PNC Honda perfectly clean, never even leaves the track. That's a handy bit of driving. That was nice. When in doubt, flat out. The key nice. to that was Dixon didn't just hammer on the brakes as soon as he lost control of the car. Had he done that, he would have been on a trajectory straight for the wall. You saw he kept all four of those Firestones rolling until he was facing backwards and could slow down. So that. I'm not, that was partly skill, guys. I won't lie That to was you. a little bit of Kiwi Rally style. It sure right was. There. It sure was. But again, just shows how treacherous that bump is in turn eight. It's so easy to get caught out, especially when you're on one of these qualifying laps, driving 10 tenths when the wind's picked up. It is, uh, it is a very tricky bit of racetrack. I went to Rally New Zealand several times. Kiwis love their rallying, yeah. Have you ever Beautiful ridden in a rally car? Oh, yes. You ever driven a rally car? Never driven a rally car. When in one as a passenger, phenomenal. So we're down to just 51 and a half minutes. Callum Eilot's had a good day, a really good day. Fastest in open test number three. He's up there in open test number four this session with the third quickest time behind Will Power and Scott McLaughlin. Leading the charge for Arrow McLaren. He's going to be going after. 
40 qualifying position. I know these, these events don't count to the official record books necessarily, but he's got a career best start of a front row at Laguna Seca. That was back in 2022. So he'd like to go one better today, try and get the number six on the pole position for his heat race tomorrow. And there's nothing that says he's not within a shout to do it based on what we've seen so far. As we say that, he goes a bit wide in turn two again, catching people off. Marty, what you got? As we ride on board with Cal Mylot, a lot of teams talking about throwing another set of stickers at the car, including the 60 team, because they've noticed the weather has changed. Listen in. Is the wind less? Yes, like a lot less. Just reference, the wind has really died down here. It's the best track conditions we've had this afternoon. And the wind has indeed died down and gotten a little bit sunnier. So I know you guys always make fun of me for being the weather guy. Townsend took a shot at me earlier, but I got to give Greg props. He saw this coming when it was dusty and windy. He said, I see it clearing back over in the west. And indeed, sunny right now. The wind died down a little bit. So, Greg, way to go, buddy. And according to our uh, data up here, Marty, it's down three to four miles per hour with the wind speed. So good catch from Greg and good catch from the team. We'll see what it means for Felix Rosenquist a little bit later. Check this out, Alex Pillow, Ridgeline Lubricants Honda. Get down into six, no, where was that? Got down into seven. The end of that long straight, bringing it back around. Here's Renus VK. This is from earlier. Oh man, just just absolutely sawing at the wheel, punishing that right rear tire. And that's what we saw just the tail end of Cal Mylot loose into three again. So laundry list of drivers that have done that diff, as well as the four air, four wheels up in the air move that we're seeing out of Marcus Armstrong here entering turn 17. That's still one of the coolest shots. Yeah, it sure is. Been a wild day for Kyle Kirkwood. Where is he in the mix of things? He's in 15th on the speed chart. Coming off a, a victory in the GTD Pro Class at the 12 hours of Sebring. That was pretty cool with Ben Barnacote and Jack Hawksworth. Jack, by the way, if you have recorded the NASCAR Truck Series race, I won't tell you where Jack Hawksworth finished, but it was a promising day. It was an eventful race, especially for uh, a fellow Sebring winner, young Connor Zilich, who started from the pole. Just saw Kirkwood take his right hand off the wheel, make an adjustment to the front roll bar there in anticipation of this fast S's section. Hard on the brakes now, decreasing radius, corner turn 14, just putting in as much lock in as he need. You see the green lights on the side of the dash, that was pushed to pass, he just used it to get up to speed there. Across the line, it was not an improvement for Kirkwood. This might be the start of a lap. Yeah, that was just prepping. So you see he's on push to pass all the way through turn 17 down the front straight. Let's stay here. Let's watch. He fires it off there, trying to save a second or two. Once he reaches the hard limiter, the overtake's not doing anything. Once he's going straight-ish, you see those green lights light back up. It's just an extra thing for the drivers to worry about. He's balancing the car. He's balancing the throttle, the steering. Then he's got to get his hand to the button to turn the overtake on. Watch again, nice short shift there, taking care of the power down. This is a, it's a hustle lap. He is working for it here. This is not a particularly well balanced car. He's having to fight a couple different issues. But this is great practice for these drivers, Diff. Oh yeah, big time. Listen to this. Into the hard limit, adjust. where he had that issue earlier. No worries that time. Out of turn nine. Here we go, the fast rhythm section, 10 through 13. Oh, 
169 miles going in, 139 mile minimum speed through there. It's so insanely fast. And let's see where this one clocks off. It's a 140.250, puts him 16th at the moment. Like I said, he was having to work a little too hard for that one. That car not quite in its happy place. As he comes in here, look to the driver's right, see that extra bundle of tires. That's one of the recent changes overnight. There was also some uh, smoothing out done uh, over in turn six uh, as well. So looking at track conditions, here's the Verizon Business Chevy of Will Power, the fast man, turn nine. Just a little twitch. A little catch. twitch, but a big penalty time-wise. Yeah. Is his teammate Scotty Mack. What did McLaughlin do? He's ripping up the paint. That's rude. It's a beautiful facility. They let you hear. Look what you've done. Oh, just pitches the back of the car. Not just up. You saw it actually move a little bit. Driver's left. He's got to correct before he lands. Is Marty Snyder, Marty? Hey, Dan, when I was talking to Scott McLaughlin and Will Power, the teammates earlier today, they both mentioned that this track is a very temperature sensitive hinge. So the beginning of this practice session, pretty cool. And now it is up above 100 degrees in terms of track temp. And once the wind died down and the weather changed, like we mentioned, it's really the track temperature that's shot up. So I'm wondering if anybody can beat Will Power's time because he said it when it was much cooler. Now it's over 100 degrees here on the track. I mean, track temp does have a huge effect on how the surface is reacting with the tires. It was about 97 degrees, I want to say, when we started this session, up over 105 now. So that's that's a meaningful difference. Every kind of degree or two, you're going to notice a little bit of a loss of grit normally in that temperature range. And the wind has dropped just dramatically again, reiterating that point. Down to seven miles per hour now from when we were on the air not that long ago. It was 17 miles an hour. Here's Augustine Canapino from Argentina. Second year for Hunko's Hollinger Racing. He was very competitive yesterday. Both him and his teammate Roman Grosjean said very competitive times. Argentinian driver really kind of coming into his own here in his second season in IndyCar. New teammate, Romain Grosjean, seemed to be getting along well, learning a lot from the Frenchman with tons of experience, not just in IndyCar, but obviously a 10-year career in Formula One as well. But to Marty's point, if that's what's going to make reading these into these lap times very difficult not knowing when each driver set a time what the track temp was what the wind conditions were all that is going to affect your ultimate lap time and so until we all are on track at the same time going for and qualifying it's going to be hard to know exactly where you stack up Linus Lundquist let's do a little ride and listen Tell me more, Mr. Indianapolis 500 pole sitter, pole winner. But I think when this guy finds his feet and finds his comfort zone, look out. Yeah. I think, he, I think he's going to be very comfortable in IndyCar. I love how calm he is on the radio. You know, we heard that transmission a little while ago saying, hey, guys, look, I'm, 
I'm good to keep running, but just information for you, bit of a vibration on this set of tires. And, you know, but it, 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 there's no panic, there's no concern. It's really just relaying the information. He's just driving around whatever the car's giving him right now. You saw him go a little bit wide there in turn six, but he's kind of just making it work. So I, I agree with you. If, as, as he gets more and more experience, you know, this, this driver's been very quick. He's won a lot of races in the junior categories, and he's proving himself already early on here in his IndyCar career. Bobby, what you got? I think Will Power and his team, Diff, are listening exactly to what we said. So Power went out a little while ago on a sticker set of tires, set the fast time of the day. They made one more run on that set, and just now they put on another set of sticker tires. So we're going to see, Hinch, truly what this track has because Power using what will be their last set of tires in this test session, trying to compare to what they did earlier today. Much hotter now. Can they pick up time, though? So this will be fascinating to watch. This is a great comparison to see. You know, track temp still creeping up. It's now 107 degrees. This looks like a bit of a prep lap from Will. He's not hustling the entries too much. He's not on the push to pass. So he's just getting some heat in the tires, getting some heat in the brakes, making sure everything's sort of where he needs it to be, where he wants it to be before he hits that push lap. And it'll be very interesting to see where it stacks up. We already know there's a couple tenths in that 3-4, or sorry, 4-5 chicane when he made that little mistake from taking too much curb. But again, this afternoon, if this man here, the most prolific pole winner in IndyCar history, as you were coming in on your G650ER yesterday, <laughs> power, if he wins the pole, it doesn't count. It doesn't go to his tally. He doesn't suddenly have 71 IndyCar career poles in his heart, and he's had he might but unfortunately on the official tally. Hey, let's tell you, there's so many great stories here this weekend. Let's tell you about another one. Let's go to Hunko's Hollinger Racing, 78 of Augustine Canapino, because on the timing box, on the timing stand, uh, on the right of this guy is Ricardo Hunkos, the dad. Well, the young gentleman you see there is Leandro Hunkos. He's 18 years old, and he has a real flair for strategy. He understands it, he gets it, and he is a great assistant to his dad. He was a, a rising uh, soccer slash football star in Argentina, uh, had a lot of passion for it, played it here in the States as well, went back to Argentina and decided and said, Dad, I actually prefer racing instead. He's tried his hand at it. He is a natural behind the wheel of a car. He's the natural behind a laptop and communicates with Canapino. And Canapino was the one who went to Ricardo and said, this kid has got the gift. We need him on the timing stand. How cool is that? That's an unbelievable family story. You love to hear that kind of thing. It runs in the family. Motorsports is uh, its a heck of a drug, man. It's an addictive thing to do. And when your dad is a such a successful team owner at many different levels of the sport, I'm not surprised that it trickled down into the offspring. And he's just 18. Well done, young Leandro Funkos. So 37 minutes left in this session before a break. And then we go into go fast mode. We go into qualifying mode. It's going to be quick hench. Eight minutes per group to get it done. It's going to be great with that push to pass. Can't stress that enough. At 40 seconds of push to pass to use at your discretion where and when to try and get yourself the best possible starting position for uh, either of the heats tomorrow. So we were keeping our eye on this guy, but I think somewhere just near the beginning of his lap, he had an issue. So this is out of turn one, down into the 2-3 section that we've seen so many drivers struggle with, and yeah, immediately just goes way wide, abandons the lap. So we don't get our direct comparison yet. I imagine he will come back around and start another lap because he's just been cruising on this in lap now. And it's time for him to get to work and try and set another one. But that just shows you, like, he prepped, he did everything he needed to do, and on the push lap, when it counted, immediately made a mistake. So that's the kind of that's the kind of issues we're going to see, I think, out of a lot of drivers once we get to qualifying, if these conditions stay similar. So that's the corner. He keeps it tidy-ish there. And you'll see well, he doesn't go for push to pass there. So I wonder if this is a full-on quality attempt for him now. No, he's not He's not reaching the button. So he's just kind of working on setup, working on balance. There goes push to pass. 
you remember? Do you remember when you were at school? There were those athletes, those kids who could kind of do everything. You know, they, they they were good at all sports. Townsend's a little bit like that, except he's horrendous at golf. Where do we find you now, T Bell? Practicing. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure any amount of practice is going to sort out my golf game. So Kevin Lee's been down here for about an hour practicing. Is that right? Draining buckets. <laughs> He's a lefty, and I conveniently found two righty putters. So, Kev, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this one. Okay. And, it's a little uh, flatter on the back. We'll go best ball. Let's go. Okay. Let's send it. We'll go okay. closest to the pin. Let's drop right here. So, guys, we'll have a quick competition. Thermal's all about competition. I didn't even know they had golf here. This is pretty awesome. Stand by. All right. So, I've never commentated golf before. If you have, so jump on in. Jump on in here. What do we got? I think it's going to break a little bit to the left. No, no, no. Get up there and hit the ball. Well, immediately, his putting stance looks very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's the right size putter for him. <laughs> Let's go. Let's get this done. We got to get back to some on track action. And if this, if this goes in. Yeah, OK, thank goodness it didn't. But there's everything. That's the point that the boys are trying to make. There is a little bit of everything here at the Thermal Club. Amazing. Oh, you know, no, lefty, lefty with the right hand. It's not enough. Show the ones I made. Show those. Don't we have B-roll? <laughs> Let's take a look. He did actually make one earlier. It was pretty impressive. It was my second putt. We believe you, Kevy. Yeah, all right. <laughs> pretty cool, though. This is nice. Oh, here we go. Now we got the official replay. Left hand, shooting right hand putt. There boom. You Straight go. in. There you go. Beauty. Hey, boom, baby. <laughs> well done, boys. Thanks for continuing the tour and showing us uh, more and more of this magnificent thermal club. I don't know about you folks at home or wherever you're watching, but that particular onboard down low, right at the front of the car, I could watch that all day. Yeah, that's one, awesome. One of my favorite views from an Indy car. For record, we did see Will Power clock a lap. It was a 139 flat on that second push lap attempt. But I don't think he was full commitment on the push to pass. So I got to say, for the track temp, kind of up over the 100s now, still pretty sporty from Will Power. No surprise. His teammate Scott McLaughlin doing a little bit of push to passing himself. So a pe Team Penske 1 2. Then Chip Ganassi's Alex Blow, Aaron McLaren's Callum Eilock. Chip Ganassi's Marcus Armstrong, Ed Carpenter Racing's Renus VK, Aaron McLaren's Alexander Rossi, then Scott Dixon, Romain Grosjean for Hunko's Hollinger, and Team Penske's Joseph Newgarden. Marty? Just to confirm, Dip, this is the second set of stickers from McLaughlin. This is the push lap. Hence, we'll see what he can do. Yeah, you can see him. He's working the push to pass. Those blue lights on the side of the dash there, illuminating every time he's out of a corner wheel straight. There they are now. So this is a genuine attempt. So we just saw power, like you said, very similar conditions to a 39 dead. But what's interesting about these Penske cars, Marty, and maybe this is something you can look into, you know, usually your push to pass button, use your thumb, you gotta take your thumb from outside that thumb hole there, hit it somewhere on the, uh, on the steering wheel. It looks to me like the Penske's have it on some sort of trigger on the back of the wheel because you see the push to pass lights come on without the thumb having to come off. That's something that I know a couple teams have gone to recently. As he's gonna hit traffic on his lap, this is not what he wants to see. One of the Hunko's Hollinger cars, I think it's Grosjean, is gonna get out of the way here. And a <laughs> little salute from McLaughlin on that one. 
but let's see what he does when he clocks across the line. That was a 38.7. Yeah, that's, so that was a bit quicker. Was sure a, bit yeah, quicker. yeah, he, he was at a... Yeah, he was at 38.9, I think, was he? And now he's... Oh, yeah. there's a little bit of... Uh, Intentionally holding yep. up Grosje on there. But yeah, no, so that's, you know, evens even. That was a quicker lap time than what his teammate Will Power had just done. Again, it didn't look to me like Power was full pulling on the push to pass, so he might still have a couple tenths in his pocket, but a great, great lap there. Those two laps, by the way, that you see on your screen are the two fastest laps of the weekend. Colton Herter has just gone P3. This is Christian Lungard, the high V Honda takeoff. Look at that. That's as high as I want my V Honda yeah. to be. Yeah. Boom, boom. Oh, come on, guys. I gave you a little bit. Yeah. Don't forget to tip your waiter. Yeah. Try the meatloaf. I'm here till Thursday. This guy's been very quick all weekend long. 13th right now. Car looks comfy, car looks sorted. The front end is very responsive. A little bit of trouble getting the power. He's Alexander Rossi. It's been a good session for the Aaron McLaren pilot. He's eighth at the moment. Final half an hour coming up before there's a break, a debrief, a little rest, a little respite, and then we go into qualifying mode. It's been a big two days. With the money day tomorrow here at the Thermal Club Million Dollar Challenge. Rossi hustling it through turn 17 onto the front straight. You see with Rossi, the push to pass is a green border around that screen. Off as he hits the brakes. The push to pass can be controlled in a couple different ways. You can have it shut off with a variety of different parameters. Normally below a certain throttle threshold or when you exceed a certain brake threshold it'll automatically cut off, or you can just re-push the button. But again, looking at it, lots of curb, and it car takes it. A little bit of a, a bit of a jump there on the exit. But see, watch his left Thank thumb. It looks like he's got to take his hand off the wheel there to get that push-to-pass button compared to the Penske guys, who I believe have it on a trigger. It's hard to tell with the dark gloves. It's yeah. He didn't get Townsend's memo about the, the, the white, white gloves. gloves. Which you would never adhere to. No, that's against my religion. All right, let's see if Alexander Rossi continues to hustle. This, this is a good look at looking lap. He's around the back over to turn nine. This is actually behind where we're talking to you from. We can see Alexander now high above the top of the tower that we're in, past this big circular grass area around turn nine, through into the high speed. This is kind of like a condensed version of the Circuit of the Americas S's as well. And he's going to come to the alt start finish line, or alt finish line, I should say, here in a second to see if this finish and box, finish and box is the call for Alexander Rossi. He does. Jumps to P3. Nicely done. Stout lap. P3, quick to 98.64. That was enjoyable. He was hustling that. He, he was hustling. That thing not quite as sorted as a few of the other cars we've seen, Marty, but that was a stout lap from Rossi. And I want to show you a moment ago with Colton Herta leaving his pit stall. He is the third driver I have seen. Here's the replay. Stall it, leaving pit road. So there's no competitive pit stops here this weekend at Thermal. He actually stalled it twice there. Scott McLaughlin was another driver who stalled it as well, leaving pit road. So I'm just curious, would they, would the teams choose to run a different first gear here that might help them more on the track? Because you're not having to leave your stall in anger trying to beat someone off a of pit road here during the race on Sunday. So would they run a different gear? Because several drivers have struggled with that here this afternoon. Yeah, I think usually you run the gear you need on the racetrack for lap time and you find a way to make it work in pit lane. Obviously, you never want to have a stall certainly not having pit stops this weekend you can afford to be a little bit uh, a little bit more cavalier with that but with those you know those hairpins in turn one turn six uh turn three you you need a first gear anyway so I, I think the teams are probably just doing it based on what's best for the lap time regardless of the fact there's no pit stops and you sometimes see that when you're running those long first gears that you're using on the racetrack we're at certain tracks. You don't actually use first gear on track, and you can set it nice and short, so that way getting out of the box is nice and easy. But I like what you're thinking, Marty. I, th I like that you're thinking that 
teams are going to compromise a little bit more because they don't have to worry about the, or compromise a little less, I should say, because they don't have to worry about pick stops. There's been some movements in the top 10. Callum Eilat's gone back up to P3. Augustine Canapino has rocketed his way into the top 10, but also Hinch runs a little wide. Yeah, uh, add him to the list of guys that have gone off in the 2-3 section here. And his teammates had uh, some issues of his own. Both cars have been quick. You see the rear stepping out there for Grosjean into the same complex. But great to see that Canapino's backing up the pace that we saw out of him yesterday. He's only two tenths off of Grosjean around a 17 turn three mile road course. That is very impressive. Oh yeah, Townsend has made it back up here to the tower and um, thanks for that roaming tour, mate. That was really enjoyable. What was it like? Um, I think what's intriguing me most, other than seeing the cars up close when you're out there, was the weather. The wind fluctuations were, were quite significant. Do you have any floss that I can borrow? <laughs> <laughs> I lit on the golf cart ride on the west end of the track. I mean, we were getting blasted for a second by what appeared to be a giant haboob that had blown in. And uh, I was grinding sand in my teeth. But uh, it's settled down now. It's beautiful again here at Thermal. And I think the unpredictability of the wind, James, is what I really took away from being out and about because how do you know where you're going to break for turn two? You got a massive tailwind blasting you in there, but it's varying 10 to 15 knots, or in your case, miles an hour. Um, uh, well, kilometers actually. I'm Canadian, <laughs> but uh, true. But no, but but that's just it. So if you're if you're out there, T Bell, you know the conditions are that tough. You've gone off at two. You've gone off, you know, at six. All these guys have dropped wheels somewhere. On that first lap, on that main try, are you going to maybe back it off that 2% to make sure you get the lap in and don't burn a lap making a mistake like that? And even if you know with absolute certainty what the tire and the, the brakes are capable of, you just don't know the wind. And a, and a shift of 15 miles an hour, a little gust, and all of a sudden it completely throws off your marker. And the opposite is true here as you head west into that high-speed headwind at peak velocity, of in terms of downforce performance, you can go that much deeper if the gust hits you at the right time. So it's it's going to be an absolute guess for a lot of these guys. That was Tim Sendrick jumping in to tell Joseph Newgarden, quote, use it up on this lap, meaning the push to pass Newgarden on a set of sticker tires. I'm wondering, Hinch, do you like this theory of Newgarden and his team kind of waiting the latest of everyone to throw on that last set of stickers for this practice session? Technically, it's closest to the time we go qualifying, so I'm definitely not against it. Def it's interesting to see that Newgarden does have to take his thumb out of the thumb hole to hit the push to pass. I noticed he also didn't use it down that back that, there it is. This is exactly what we're talking about, Townsend. You're showing up to that corner a few miles an hour faster awesome. because yeah. of the push to pass. You have that tailwind. Is it worth trying to go 10 tenths when that's the possibility? And if you end up starting your heat in eight, ninth place. Is that a half a million dollar mistake? Uh, exactly right. Exactly right. Hey, Marty, speaking of half a million bucks and, and going for it, as I was ripping around on the golf cart to the various locations at the start of this show, I think I heard that you've got a theory as we watch one more replay of Newgarden. Yeah, just in hot. Marty, that you've got a theory on, on the, the way to win. The path to victory is to absolutely tank the first half of the main and save your tires. Uh, talk me through this. All right, so it only applies if you're really starting on the last row and you're not going to pass your way up through everybody in 10 laps anyway. You could run 10 seconds slower in theory during those 10 laps, save a bunch of tires. This is an old late model theory I'm coming up with, Townsend, okay. right? It works at a lot of late model races. You want to win a race at Myrtle Beach, that's how you win a race. You kind of go slow, and then when it comes time to go, you go. So that would be the second half of the race. And and listen, if you're not going to, you know, you're talking, you're losing 10 seconds or two seconds of lap time in 10 laps. So. In theory, you could have tires that are worth a second and a half, two seconds, and you could go hard in those final 10 laps. I don't know, it's worth a shot, why not? I like the way you're thinking, I, you know, if that's true, then I don't think you have to be on the last row. I think you could be in the bottom six and probably do that. You're talking about maybe as much as three seconds a lap of both tire dig and then fuel slowing you down when they refill the tank based on what we've seen in practice. So. I don't know. I mean, I, I can make an argument that the back half of the field could try that, but it's a fascinating theory that the key is you have to commit to it. If you're going to do it, you do it early and you just drag around. See, interesting to see Joseph Newgard not trying to hit the push to pass in between turns five and six. 
but then does obviously use it down the long stretch here into seven. A couple different strategies. Will Power, Scott McLaughlin on their faster laps. We're using everything. Here's Will here through that section. Man, he's using all the racetrack. Yeah. Hey, uh, one, one driver that has grabbed my attention as Will had to catch that there as well is Felix Rosenquist. He is down in 27th position at the moment in that Maya Shank machine. And he has, I've just been told, he has just put stickers on now and will bring that Bon Jovi radio car out. Here he is, his fro. And James, you know the feeling for a driver when the stickers go on, it's like pounding a pre-workout shake. I mean, you get, <laughs> you get jacked up up in the seat and you know you've got a, an absolute fistful of fresh drip coming your way that you've got to put to good use and the only way to do that is to push like hell. That's, that's what you got to do. you got to hustle. We've seen some guys get some good lap time out of really hustling these race cars but the other thing you got to do is find your gap as we ride on board with Colin Herta here. Traffic in front of him. I know we talk about this every week in qualifying. It doesn't matter how long the track is. <laughs> Even if we split the group in half, you're still going to get drivers tripping over each other and finding that perfect window, not making that mistake, executing everything with the addition of thinking about the push to pass, it's gonna be a huge challenge for these guys. So as you guys have had the benefit of uh, the booth for the last two hours, when I see that bump between turns eight and nine, yeah. I don't think anything rides it better than a Team Penske car. Would you agree? I mean, it's, it's almost non-existent at times when you see the onboards for Power and McLaughlin and New Garden. And we certainly haven't seen the, the super slow-mo saves from a Penske yeah. car that we've seen out of Andretti's, out of That's Ganassi's, right. you know, it's... Uh... Pietro Fittipaldi had a moment there yesterday as well. All right, so now he's found a little bit of space Colton Herter has. Uh, he's still got uh, Christian Lungard up the road a little bit, but he's got some space behind. Alex Pelot is behind him, but this looks a little more spacious to get after it with just 19 minutes to go. And then that is officially the end of the test. Then we go into qualifying mode. That's what we like to hear. You, know, you don't see him get on the push to pass, so this isn't a 10-10s quality lap. Power did just do another one. We were on board them for a little bit of it. It was a 39-9. So not where he needs to be from a competitive standpoint. It just shows you how much those tires fall off in just a single run. I don't get on it, on it very often, but I think I'm going to be on the Marty train tomorrow with the late model strategy. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I like that call. I mean, if you're starting in the back towns, then what do you got to lose, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. no-brainer from the final row. Yeah. Sixth, that seems, that seems brave from sixth, but... Well, it's either half a mil or nothing if you finish sixth, so it's, it, it's going to be tempting. It's Kevin Lee. What you got, Kev? Well, just kind of looking at the leaderboard, and we remember at St. Pete that Colton Herta, uh, who we're watching right now on board, was the top Honda in fifth. Right now, it's Chevy, one, two, three, four, five. Herta is the top Honda running in sixth. We're not done yet, but just kind of watching early in the season to see if this is any kind of a trend. There was a lot of conversation after the race last week from Pato Award and Joseph Newgard and others uh, how much effort Tracks Chevy put put into the offseason of just kind of gathering together and doing a big think of what they could do. Just very small refinements are allowed at this point in the process from season to season. Just three Hondas. It's a great point, Kev. Just three Hondas in the top ten at the moment. The Chevy show up there. It doesn't count yet. Colton Hurd on the radio upset at Lungard backing up into him. Saying how much, how much track does he need? Lungard has Alex Rossi in front of him on track. Rossi's got Rike in front of him, who's got Grosjean in front of him. This is just classic, classic IndyCar running into each other, fighting over real estate. Get ready for racy radio. <laughs> <laughs> We've already seen a couple birds flip today. Oh, yeah, it's coming. As we inch ever closer to over $1.7 million on the line, that'll raise anybody's temperature. All right, remember we told you that Rosenquist was just putting on the stickers? This will be Felix's chance to show us what this Bon Jovi Radio Auto Nation Sirius XM Honda has got. Hopefully it's a lot. He's 27th and last right now on the timing charts. He's clocked 18 laps. He's been up, he's been up the front for the majority of the weekend. Top 10 in session three, top 10, top two in session two, top seven in 
session one. It's been a good weekend so far for the Swedish driver. Let's see what he's got now. I still think he's prepping tires here a bit. This doesn't like look like full push. I don't see him on the button. Yeah, it's interesting to see the different strategies that drivers are taking. It's going to be out one time by and then go is, is my hunch. I think that's probably right. He was up in that IndyCar driver lounge. There was a number of VIPs and rock star looking folks up there. And looking at that Camus logo, there was some uh, there was some fine wine flowing too. Some big pours going on midday. How was the prosciutto? Good for the next lap to be our push lap. Remember, we'll be in peak one. Or remember your overtake. Prosciutto uh, was not sampled, but it was admired from afar. A friend of mine in Miami is frying prosciutto for a breakfast meat, crisping it up. You guys tried that? Absolutely phenomenal. Game changer. Rob, uh, Rob's giving it a big thumbs up. Modest amount of meat, but just the right sort of saltiness to start your day. You can tell I've been absolutely ruined by my hour and a half here at Thermal. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how I'm going to go home after this. All right, the prep work is done. You saw Felix adjust the engine map. Now, again, I'm starting to push to pass right now if I'm in the car to make sure I've got that extra pace across the alternate start. Did you hear that overtake not, not working? You yeah. just said, yeah, no, Biff. No, Hit the button. That's not working, bro. <laughs> Looked like he was trying another hit of the button there, Diff, but I don't see anything populating on his wheel that suggests no, it's working. No. Well, extra horsepower or not, this is where you got to eat. You got to start taking big chunks here on fresh tires to try to find time. Let's watch how rhythmic he is here through these high speed S's. Chasing the front a little bit, but the power down looks decent. It really does. Keep in mind, he is 27th on the speed chart. He jumps to 17th, but still, that would be his lowest position of any of the sessions so far this weekend. Marty? Nine hours of testing, Diff, about to wrap up for these IndyCar teams. It's been a solid one for Roman Grosjean and his team, but he wants to make sure this final change is the right one. Listen in. If you one, please, do you have... 13 seconds in front. Okay, but default 2 is what I asked before, correct? No, it was changed right around when you came in. But I want it more aggressive. Okay, copy. And that's part of a new team learning each other, right? He said he wants to be more aggressive with this change when he came back to pit road for right now. I think the other thing, Hinch, is kind of throwing everyone for a loop. We've been following the track temperature as Grosjean leaves to go out for this final run of the day. Earlier, it was below 100, then it went to 107. Now it's down around 100 degrees, so it's cooled down once again. So I think that's kind of throwing teams for a loop. Reading the track, very difficult in this final test here at Thermal. You know, and, and honestly, when Kevin interviewed Connor Daly, he kind of he kind of nailed it to a degree is don't overthink it because it is so easy to get lost in what's happening right at this moment but you do have to sort of try to predict as best you can where the track's going to be what the car's going to do and make those adjustments but you can't sit there and and, and stress about it too much because you really can over engineer yourself out of the box and the truth is that you might find a tenth or two with the perfectly engineered solution 
but you might find three tenths by just flat out getting up on the wheel and figuring it out and just willing yourself to the time. There's enough curb to use here. There's enough kind of fancy footwork that's possible to get the car to rotate in the slower corners, get to the apex, get to the line that you need to be on that I, I still think nothing matters more than the wheel man and, and getting up on the wheel and getting it done. You know what's really cool for this facility is that it's been well used over the years since it was established. Well used to a variety of levels, right? There are professional drivers who are here with the club members and there's a variety of cars that are driven on here. But this track has never seen the intensity that it has over these two days and that it's about to see in this qualifying session that's coming up in a couple of hours. Yeah, I talked to the track a little bit about that section that broke up at the exit of turn five that they worked on earlier. And in true thermal fashion, Tim Rogers and all the amazing people here, including the general manager, Nick Rhodes, they told me that tonight, 6 p.m., as soon as track activity stops, they've got a huge crew coming in, asphalt trucks. They are, they are going to work all through the night. If it ain't right, they are going to fix it, and this place will be pristine for the Million Dollar Challenge tomorrow. Will Power just set a lap at a 138.7, kind of matching Scott McLaughlin, only a tenth off of his best, so another solid effort from the 12 McLaughlin on track now. Is he trying to respond to that? I think maybe he thinks he's got more left. Remember, he was uh, a little upset with Romain Grosjean earlier. Uh, and did it cost him a tenth? Did it cost him half a tenth? Who knows? We'll see. Look at, the, look at the consistency with the McLaren boys right now, too, just in third, fourth, and fifth. I mean, what is that? Less than half a tenth separating those three drivers again on a three-mile circuit, 17 turns. That's impressive. That, that organization's really starting to gel in a strong way. And I think a lot has to do with just Alexander Rossi figuring out what that team's about a year in, figuring out what his teammate does behind the wheel. And uh, I think that the difference between those two or this, these three drivers, you got Malukas coming back soon. I think it's going to be really tight in the second half of this year. It's a papaya pylon at the moment, isn't it? All in three positions there, third, fourth, fifth. Scotty Mack, nine minutes to go. The Expel Chevy might just see if there's anything left right before we finish this session to go back, debrief, reset, and get, get it ready to go for a very abbreviated, it's going to be super intense qualifying session here at the Thermal Club Million Dollar Challenge. How cool would it be if Firestone surprised us with 27 sets of reds that just rolled out <laughs> magically? <laughs> oh, Maybe. Don't toy with my emotions. <laughs> oh. I think that that's what this event um, hopefully becomes year after year is one for great experimentation and just mixing it up, having fun with new ideas, testing new ideas yeah. out in a non-points pain but cash pain fashion. I've heard so many fantastic ideas just today from drivers, from team managers. Hey, what about this? What about that? This could be a really fun test bed for the future. Not sure the last time we uh, reminded you too of the format after qualifying is complete and how it, how it goes is the odd numbered finishes in qualifying that'll form heat one even numbered finishes heat two Hinch what are you frowning at is that true we had a big debate about this yeah I just looked at Russ Thompson okay senior vice president of I've data analytics no group, group one, one is heat one. one group one pardon me there you go so everyone is in group one stays in group one they run heat, heat one. one everyone that's in group two stays in group two that's heat two and that's why the balance or imbalance, if you want to look at it from a wins and polls perspective, is Which so is much more dramatic. Right. <laughs> if it sort of evened itself out, it would be different. Marty? So, Diff, we rode on board with uh, Joseph Newgarden a moment ago. Saw him have an off on an attempted qualifying sim lap. Well, they decide to fire another set of stickers, Townsend, here at the two car. So, Newgarden going to make another run at a qualifying sim. Oh. And the wind has picked up. So, let's watch what he does right here. Long back straightaway. Tailwind here. Where does he break? You're right about that Penske compliance over turn eight. Yeah, he was a little wide, I thought, there, though. It looks like the bump is almost a little bit bigger offline, so a little bit sloppy through the first couple of S's. Now into the headwind. This is where a guy like Joseph Newgarden 
the RoboCop is brave with downforce, and he goes in deep right there. What did that do for him? Ten. Not much. 39-4, last lap. Not his fastest of the session. That's seven tenths off of power. So now you got six minutes. Plug in real quick, look at some data. Do you try a quick change? I think you got to throw everything you can at it. Newgarden hasn't been happy about his outright pace. He's yeah. been okay with long pace, but when we talked to him this morning, Diff, you could tell he was like, yeah, we just haven't been able to land that one fast lap. All right, we've got some serious activity on track now, Kevin, for this final five and a half minutes. Get ready. Here we go. And there's still a chance that we see quicker times. It's use them if you got them because the tires do not carry over. It's seven sets for the nine hours of testing. Then it is an additional set uh, coming up for qualifying, one for the heat race, and one more if you make the final. Callum Eilat is one of those that just put sticker Firestones on. This is his first lap. You can see him weaving. He didn't have clear enough tracks. So he was trying to find a gap. So the next one will be his push lap. I've seen others going to stickers. By the way, I've seen some questions, people asking about alternates. There are no alternates this weekend. This is the only tire of choice. Same Firestone Firehawk tire, same uh, design and construction that was used at Barber last year in race format. Oh, oh big moment there for Callum Eilat. But he didn't lift. Wow. That was a big moment of courage there. The thing sliding off the track, snappy hands, but he kept his foot in it. Sure did. That was wild coming off turn 17. This guy's got his mojo going now. He is in the groove, loving life, what he's doing. Check this out. Off turn 17, little tail steps out, big jump off. Yeah, no problem. Look more dramatic from the onboard than what it was from the exterior. Here's Scott McLaughlin. Whoa, all right. That Penske compliance, not what we were talking about. <laughs> because that was... So much for that theory, although that looked like it probably cased it, literally, gearbox case. Hanging off the back there of the car. There's oh. Pato Award. That's just another, that's just another corner in the life of Pato. <laughs> Guys sideways always. Christian Lunga has gone to the top of this session as we watch the replay of Pato Award. So there's been a change at the top in these closing minutes of the final test session. Hinch, this could have been a massive that, shot. I, I guarantee massive. you, inside the car, he was just staring at that Armco not too far off. If that had gone a little bit differently, could have been game over. But this guy, it's game on. Christian Lundgaard, he's been quick in every single session. He was up there third this morning, fifth yesterday, and a 38.2, half a second faster than That's power huge. right now. That Track is. temp is coming down. You know, we've been talking about that. Wind is calmer than the worst it's been, but not as good as it's been at other times. So again, the conditions just everything changes lap to lap here. Three minutes left on the clock of this fourth and final open test session. Before we go into quality mode, here's the PNC Bank Honda of Scott Dixon. Had a big moment earlier in this session. And the wind really blowing here at the west end of the track. It might have calmed down, but now look at the just building as it picks up big time towns and it's right. like what it like like it was earlier today and here comes the dust as well are we in haboob conditions haboob in the desert yeah no it's yeah, it already is. Side of <laughs> but you can see i mean even just from the camera you can see how the, the dust is filling the air if there's a haze look at wow that. and look that. at pit lane i mean it, it's that was in the space of a minute. Yeah. It's arrived. It's it's come in and arrived very fast. This is this is why we had a slight delay at the top of the session uh, almost two hours ago. And here's the thing. Nothing cleans a track like IndyCar circulating at speed. So we've got a minute 50 left. If this continues to blow for a bit and then you get back out for quali, it's a whole new racetrack for everybody to negotiate. Well, either way, I'm I'm pretty upset if I'm in group one Look at that thing. for a couple reasons. One, it's a stacked group, but two, they're going on track first. It's going to be way fresher dust layer. Yeah. But you're, if you're in group two, you've already had 10 minutes of IndyCar running. And my understanding is that 
as soon as this is finished, there will be a member NASCAR time attack race That's right. on a different kind of rubber. Which I don't believe has happened throughout the course of the weekend. No. Let's throw out the variables. <laughs> Let's mix it up a little bit. A minute to go in this session. This is the Gainbridge Honda of Colton Herter. Seventh on the time chart at the moment. That's headed by Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan's Christian Lungard with a flyer. Best time of the weekend by a huge margin. Hanging on to it. See all over the push to pass. Maintains it through 17. Another effort here from the Gamebridge driver into turn one. Turn two. No, not going to do it. The curse of oh, turn two. See the visor so going. So yeah. upset. It's so hard to be consistent. Wind up to 17 miles an hour again, Diff. It's really getting bad out there. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. Three, two, one. Session done and open test. Free practice officially completed. Let's check in with Marty with a guy who had plenty of speed in this session, Marty. Will Power second quickest. I mean, have you ever driven in conditions like this, Will, where the, there's so much wind and a dust storm and then it calms down? I mean, it's been crazy. Save on every range in the Oak Furniture Land. Okay, so uh, F1 cut in their feed to go to formula three so let's go through the classification then for the final test session it's christian lungard on top with will powers and scott mclaughlin alexander rossi patro ward rounds out the top five then it is callum Eilock, colton herter roman grosjean venus vk alex polo in 10th Newgard and Dixon, Ericsson, Canapino, Armstrong, Fittipaldi, Blomqvist, Rosenquist, Rasmussen, Ray Hall, Linus Lundqvist, Santino Ferrucci, Carl Kirkwood, Kiffin Simpson, Colin Braun, Nolan Siegel, and Sting Ray Rob. You'll be redirected to the Formula 3 feature race here on YouTube, so you do not have to go anywhere. And we will see you at midnight GMT, so in two hours' time for qualifying for the $1 million challenge. See you then.